Are you tired of wasting time, energy, money, and filament on failed 3D prints? Well, you're in luck because today we're going to be taking a look at five rookie mistakes in 3D printing that you might be making right now, how to fix them, and help you go from a rookie to a 3D printing pro in absolutely no time. Our first rookie mistake actually is going to pertain to not taking care of your build plate. See, something really common that I see is people will just take and they will touch all over their build plate and get their finger greases all over it. And much like building a house, the first layer of a 3D printer is your foundation. And when you're 3D printing and you're building up something layer by layer, your foundation layer is what's going to hold it all in place. And if your build plate is absolutely filthy from not taking care of it, then you're going to have a really bad time when your part detaches and you're fighting a spaghetti monster and maybe getting yourself a blob of death. So how do you actually take care of your build plate? One of the key elements is visual inspections. You should, on a somewhat regular cadence, actually visually look over your build plate and just make sure that it's completely free of damages. If there's any holes, nicks, things like that in the build surface, then those are going to be reflected in your final print. The next little bit of build plate maintenance is going to be to make sure that you're regularly washing your build plate. My favorite way to clean a PEI sheet or glass sheet especially is actually using a really good high quality degreasing dish liquid. Like personally, I always use Dawn Platinum or Dawn Power Wash because, well, I'm pretty sure that could clean the stripe off a skunk. After you're done scrubbing the build plate with a high quality dish soap, then I like to come back and clean it up with isopropyl alcohol. And this is for a couple of reasons. The isopropyl alcohol is going to actually help the water evaporate off of the build plate faster. And it's also going to take care of any leftover debris that you maybe missed. A pro tip that you can utilize while you're doing this is actually use uncolored paper towels. So just regular bog standard white paper towels seem to be the best. If you're using a microfiber towel, then you're running the risk of introducing lint or debris onto the build plate that you're working to clean off right now. And you wanna make sure that isopropyl alcohol that you're using is 91% or stronger. Anything much less than that, and the water content is not going to fully evaporate off of the build plate, and you might leave water spots, which is really counterintuitive. When it comes to actually cleaning your build plate, a lot of people will tell you to wipe the build plate with isopropyl alcohol. And that's really good wisdom to have, but it's not a fix-all. And that's why we scrub it really good with some good dish soap. And make sure that when you're removing parts from the build surface, don't just grab a hold of it when you're flexing it, because now as you're doing this, you're introducing finger oils and dirt from your hands into these areas. And also, depending on what kind of material you're using and what your build surface is, you might need to incorporate an interference layer. Personally, I always prefer to use hairspray, but you can also use things like an Elmer's glue stick or even a purpose-built solution like Magigoo or Vision Miner nanopolymer adhesive to help things stick to your bed and release when it cools. Certain materials like PETG are going to absolutely just bond to PEI and glass. Sometimes it's important to have that interference layer so the material that you're printing with doesn't actually touch directly with the build sheet or the glass. So on one hand, you can have too little stick and you get a spaghetti monster. On the other hand, you have too much stick and PTG is gonna rip chunks from a borosilicate glass sheet. So make sure you're exercising caution and making sure that your build surface is clean and if needed, you're running an interference layer that's appropriate for the materials that you're using. The second tip on our list is actually going to be filament choice for the job. Every single type of filament that you're working with has specific properties. There will be a filament that is best for what you're doing. When you're working on a project, you have to think, do I need it to flex? Yes, print with TPU. Do I need something stiff or just to look nice with a wide color variety? PLA is your material. Do I need UV resistance? If you do, you need ASA. Does it just need to have the higher flexibility and temperature resistance? Then ABS is going to be perfectly suitable for that application. You also have to pay special attention to the actual printing characteristics. Like I mentioned in our previous tip, PTG sticks really well to the build plates. ABS and ASA require an enclosure. PLA and TPU do not. So you have to think about your material choice for your project and the setup that you have. Do you need to modify your printer so it is enclosed? Do you need to add an interference layer to your print bed to make sure you don't destroy your print bed? 
think about what you're going to do before you do it, and you'll save yourself a lot of time and energy, as well as money, and not having to reprint parts. You'll have a much higher success rate with your end product doing exactly what you need it to do if you're giving yourself a starting point for success. If you make sure you're using the right filament for the job, chances are you're not going to have to go back and reprint that part in potentially a day. The next rookie mistake that I see a lot is you're storing your filament wrong. 3D printing filament companies put a lot of effort into their packaging, especially if it's a company who's worth their salt, somebody like Polymaker, Newmakers, Prusament, and the list goes on. But these filament manufacturers are shipping you their material in sealed bags with desiccant. And there's a reason for that, and it's not just for us to make a funny joke about tearing the bag open, it's to protect the material. You see, most 3D printing filaments are hygroscopic, so they're going to actually absorb moisture from the atmosphere. So, as pretty as your filament shelf is, where you have every single open spool on display, and this is something that we're guilty of here as well, as good as it is to look at, it's not the best way to store your filament. If you're not opening a filament to use it for a task, leave it in its sealed bag to help make sure it's not being affected by the environment. When it sits on the shelf, it takes on that moisture and it's going to cause issues like stringing, you're going to have skipped extrusion, you might hear hissing, snapping, and popping from your hot end. That's the moisture being essentially boiled out of the filament, which is going to decrease the strength and lead to a higher amount of print failures, which is in turn going to cost you time, energy, money. The other issue with leaving your filament out and exposed aside from the moisture is actually going to be dust and debris. Once you try to run that spool of filament through your printer again, you're just carrying all that filth into your extruder and your hot end, which could potentially lead to clogs and jams. So how do you store your filament to prevent these issues from happening? Well, the freest way is actually to just use the bag that it came in. A lot of filament companies are actually shipping their filament in resealable bags. I know for a fact that Polymaker and Newmakers are two examples of this. All of their filament comes sealed in a reusable bag that also has a desiccant pack. Hang on to those. When you're not using the material, put it back in the bag. If you're a heathen and you've destroyed the bag, maybe find a big resealable Ziploc bag or you can DIY your own dry boxes, especially for materials like nylon or TPU that are going to absorb a lot of moisture. If you want to get really fancy, you could look into vacuum bags. There are some that are made purpose-built for 3D printing and the new Polymaker Poly Dryer is another great higher-end solution. It's a dehydrator and filament dry box system in one. After you've dried your filament, it'll stay dry in a storage container but an option like that might be costly for some if you're not using it as just a dehydrator. It's probably a good idea to have big resealable bags and spare desiccant packs on hand just to keep your filament in tip-top shape so that way you can bring your number of print failures down. Regardless of whatever choice you make when it comes to storing your filament, it doesn't matter as long as it's not exposed to the elements of the room. It may look nice, but it's not really the most practical. You know who always stores their filament correctly? The sponsor of this week's video, PCBWay. Did you know that PCBWay does more than just make custom PCBs? They offer a wide variety of services from 3D printing of all sorts, injection molding, sheet metal manufacturing, and even CNC machining. If you need a high resolution resin 3D print but don't want to buy a resin 3D printer, just upload your one off and get an instant quote from their website. You can even print parts out of metal if you've ever found yourself having a strong desire to own a titanium benchy, PCBWay can even make that happen for you. Using PCBWay services could not be more straightforward. All you have to do is select the manufacturing method that you need for your job, upload your file, and then choose the material that you'd like it to be made out of. At that point, you can enter the quantity of parts that you need, and you can even do things like custom tapped holes and part marking. No matter where you are in your design process, PCB Way has your back. Their super fast turnaround times are guaranteed to help you keep your project moving forward and on time. A huge thank you to PCB Way for sponsoring this week's video. And now back to the action. While we're talking about filament, a quick bonus tip for you is buy good quality filament. I know it might be tempting to save a couple of dollars by buying some bargain bin Amazon filament. That's not always the solution. Just because that five to $10 spool looks really attractive, doesn't mean it's going to be what you need it to be. Chances are it's not been treated very well, it may not have been made the best, and it might increase your print failures. So while you may have paid half the price for the filament, it may take you three times as many prints to actually make a quality one happen. 
save yourself the aggravation, spend a few more dollars on a reputable filament company, and you will be way happier. Check the links in the video description for the filaments that we like to use in the studio. A special thanks to our level 3 YouTube channel members, Nathan Wolford and Snail3D. Thank you guys. Thank you to all of our members for helping to financially support the channel and keep the lights on in the studio. The best way that you can help support the channel is actually to like this video, leave a comment, tell us what you think about what we're doing, and which tip you found to be the most helpful. Share it with a friend, and if you've gotten some value out of a few of the videos that we've done so far, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on anything that we're doing in the future. The next rookie mistake that I see far too commonly is not optimizing your slicer settings. Simply put, you're wasting time and filament by not making sure that you're taking a few minutes to prepare for the job that you're printing. If you're printing something that's just meant to be pretty and sit on a shelf, then you can probably get away with knocking your infill from, say, 15% as default down to 5 maybe even 10% to make sure that the part looks good. It doesn't need to be structurally sound, and the main purpose for your infill in a part like that is just going to be holding up the top and bottom layers. On the flip side of that, if your parts are coming out weak, you need to increase your wall count and your top and bottom layer count. That's where the strength is going to predominantly come from, not just infill. If you go from two to four or five walls, you're going to do an absolutely amazing job of increasing the strength of the part. It's all going to be based off of how are you going to be using this thing? Where is the load coming from? Just upping infill doesn't do that. You also need to make sure that you're choosing the right infill pattern for what you're doing. Chances are you're wasting time by not optimizing this setting. There are a ton of different infill patterns now, and they're not always the best suited. If you need to increase the crush strength of a part that you're printing, make sure you're using a filament that supports the direction the load is going to come from. That will be a time when infill does increase the strength of a part. On the flip side of that, just because gyroid happens to be the prettiest infill, it doesn't make it the best. It is going to be a slower moving one, because your print head has to move around a lot more. If you're trying to just increase the speed of a part, then go with something that has long straight lines like cubic. That'll be a really strong infill pattern. And because your printer is getting more time to accelerate, you're going to decrease your overall print time. The next really important thing to look at when you're in the slicer is going to be your part orientation. So you see 3D printing layer lines, they build up and it's a lot like wood grain. The direction that the layer lines run in is going to be the most separation risk. So if you're printing a stick, for example, if you print it tall ways in the z-axis on your build plate, you're going to be able to snap it really easy. But if you print it along the print bed, then the layer lines are going to be working to give your part strength. So really look at that and analyze. Think, how am I going to lay this out to utilize the least amount of filament necessary to make the strongest and best looking part I can. Spend a few minutes watching YouTube videos on slicer optimizations and experiment with different settings. Print some things that you can break, just so that way you can personally get a feel for, if I change this setting, what happens to my prints? Your slicer doesn't need to be scary, and I'm not saying that you have to get into all sorts of crazy settings, but you can spend a fair amount of time in there tuning and optimizing to get parts that look better than stock and are going to be stronger, or at least save you time and filament if you're just doing decorative things. Our fifth and final rookie mistake that I see is ignoring routine maintenance. A 3D printer is a high precision machine designed for you to be able to do things repeatedly with incredible accuracy. And if you're not taking care of your 3D printer, it's not going to take care of you. Think about it like your car, a 3D printer needs regular service. You're not going to go three years without checking your oil, having it changed, checking your coolant to make sure your engine doesn't overheat, rotating your tires to make sure that you're getting even wear. A 3D printer is really similar. There are certain things that you have to do frequently to make sure that your machine is performing at its peak condition. We already talked about build plate maintenance as a section in this video because that's incredibly important. The first layer is the foundation for a successful print. You also have other things one of the big routine maintenance parts on a 3D printer is going to be lubrication. Several parts on the 3D printer need to have grease on them to make sure that they're functioning appropriately. And the Z-Rod is the prime example of that. Regardless of how many threaded rods that you have that run your Z-axis, they need to be greased. A heavier grease like 
super lube or even just regular bog standard white lithium grease are going to be great solutions for that. Make sure that you clean the old grease off before you add new or else you're just going to be introducing the dust and debris that accumulates and sticks. These heavier weight lubricants tend to just attract filth. So make sure you keep them clean, keep fresh grease on there to reduce wear and tear on the machine and keep the motion nice and smooth. You're also going to need to frequently check your belts and this is especially true on these new super fast 3D printers that are becoming the norm as time goes on. The belts are going to stretch as time goes on, and if your belts are either too tight or too loose, you're going to start introducing artifacts to your prints, and that can cause issues with dimensional accuracy or just surface finish. Something that I don't see talked about very frequently as a routine maintenance step on a 3D printer is actually regularly changing out your nozzle. Filament is abrasive, and as you're feeding meter upon meter of filament through that really small opening, eventually wear and tear is going to start to set in and your 0.4 nozzle is going to open up to be wider than you paid for. It's going to cause issues with dimensional accuracy and stringing. So you should make it a part of your routine maintenance, especially if you don't have a hardened nozzle of some kind, to change it out somewhat frequently. Now, I don't know exactly how many spools of filament or how long you should go. That's going to depend on how much you print and what kind of materials you're using. Obviously glow in the dark and carbon fiber filled materials are going to be more abrasive and cause more issues. And regular PLA seems to be able to go for quite some time. But after you've rolled out other troubleshooting steps, you should probably make changing your nozzle to be something higher up on the priority list. If you have a 3D printer that involves manually leveling the bed, even if you do have automatic bed leveling, you should periodically check to make sure the bed is level and that your Z offset is tuned in just right, because if it's not, you're going to run into issues with first layer adhesion and have your parts not fully sticking to the print bed. 3D printers have a lot of motion to them, and that motion, especially at higher speeds like we see on new printers, is going to cause vibrations, and these resonances can cause your screws to back out. So, every so often, you should probably go through your machine and Make sure that all of your fasteners are snug, especially the ones that are holding the motion system together, and your extruder. As time goes on, these are going to become loose, and you can run into skipped steps or layer shifts as a result. Now, just because the screw is backed off a little bit, especially in the cases of pulleys or idlers in your actual motion system of the machine, these screws backing off might only cause an intermittent issue that can be hard to chase. But personally, on more than one occasion, I've run into a situation where an idler bearing on a motor shaft actually loosened itself and would periodically cause layer shifts. And I spent weeks chasing this issue down. And finally, I thought, well, I should probably go through and fasten and tighten everything up. Once I did, the printer was back in tip-top shape. So as time goes on, make sure you're actually tightening these up and checking them for wear and tear. Basically, what I'm saying is treat your 3D printer like a precision machine that is designed for performance. And you're going to be rewarded so much by taking good care of it. It's going to lead to much higher quality prints and really decreasing your print failures. There you go. There are five rookie 3D printing mistakes that you might be making right now, as well as some tips on how to avoid and fix them. Were you surprised by anything that you saw on the list? What are your 3D printing rookie mistakes that you encountered along the way? Let us know in the comments. If you're having issues with your machine, sometimes it's best to take a step back and just think about what is the most simple thing happening. You're going to save yourself a lot of time, headache, and money if you just take that step back, take a deep breath, and think about what is avoidable and what can I do. When it comes down to it, the most important thing that you can do to save yourself all of that hassle is level your bed.